Hi, everybody. It is wonderful to be with you today as we speak about the launch of a phenomenal knowledge platform about the future of our continent. From Kigali in Rwanda, from Johannesburg in South Africa, from Sweden and also from Vienna, Australia, welcome to what I'm sure is going to be a great panel today. My name is Feriel Hafiji. I'm a journalist with the Daily Maverick and we're the hosts with the Institute of Security Studies um, of today's webinar. Very welcome, Dr. Yaki Saliers, the Head of African Futures and Innovation at the Institute for Security Studies. Joining us from Kigali, Ms. Nandor Bekele Thomas, thank you so much for joining us, even though you've hurt your arm, the CEO of the African Union's Development Agency, NEPAD, and also the resident coordinator of the UN in South Africa. Um, from Vienna, Professor Jonathan Moyer, the architect of this wonderful um, portal or website um, from the Frederick S. Pardee Center at the University of Denver. So I've learned a little bit in preparing for today that this African Futures Tracker is a knowledge platform like I've never seen one before. And as journalists, I've been covering our continent for decades. So what it offers you is these bite-sized chunks of knowledge brought to us in videos, in charts, and then in much deeper papers, um, if that's what you're looking for. I've thoroughly enjoyed, Yaki, going through the site Congratulations to you and your team. I understand that this has been years and years of work. Please tell us more about it, and I believe you're going to show us a video as well. Thank you very much, Ferriel, and thanks for hosting us. It's actually a great pleasure to be here with you, with uh, my good friend Jonathan Moyer from uh, Denver and Ms. Uh, Bekele Thomas from uh, the NEPAD Outer Agency, the African Union's Development Agency. Ferriel, I thought this is several years in working. I thought yes. the easiest way of, of explaining this to show you a short video, which is a summary of a video which is on the home page of the site, which explains how to use the site. So um, I was asked before I do this to ask all the panelists, please to mute yourself, yes. um, which we which we should do, and then I'll uh, I'll show the video. This website models potential progress towards the African Union's Agenda 2063 vision through the individual and combined impact of various sectoral scenarios. The forecasting horizon coincides with the end of the third 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063 in 2043. You can view the future of Africa geographically or thematically. All information is free and available to download after registration. The Geographic Future section of the website covers each of Africa's 54 countries, five regions, the eight regional economic communities or RECs recognized by the African Union and the four country income groups as defined by the World Bank. In each, you can review the likely current path forecast and the impact of 12 sectoral scenarios such as on demographics, agriculture, education, and leapfrogging. You can access the Geographic Future page for each geography by clicking on the map on the home page or the menu bar. Each geographic report contains a summary, 60 interactive charts, the current path forecast, and the effect of 12 sectoral scenarios, such as the impact of more stability, a demographic dividend, better health wash infrastructure, or the impact of the combined Agenda 2063 scenario. Each chart is interactive and accompanied by interpretive text. The thematic futures section starts with an overview of Africa's current path, followed by a discussion analysis and forecast of different sectoral scenarios such as agriculture, education and manufacturing and the impact of a combined Agenda 2063 scenario. It's easy to click through to any of these sectors using the navigation bar on the left. For example, to explore Africa's demographic future and how Africa can advance its demographic dividend, the page provides a summary 
all the associated charts and comprehensive interpretation. You can then navigate and read as you wish and also register to download material. In summary, this site serves as a comprehensive resource to help government, business and civil society plan for the future by presenting realistic forecasts across different sectors and geographies. The site is constantly updated and will continue to evolve based on your feedback and input. For more information, feedback or to get in touch, please reach out to the team. So that's a very brief summary of, of the site. Um, the site uses a platform, a forecasting platform that was hosted and developed by the Frederick S. Pardy Center for International Futures, which is why Professor Jonathan Moyer is, uh, amongst others, on this call. And our timeline is orientated in line with the Auda NEPAD 2063 vision for the long term future of Africa. So uh, perhaps with that, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to talking about Agenda 2063. I've always wondered about the value of such very long-term planning, but I'm, looking, but I'm sure we'll get to that question. Right now, we are going to play a pre-recorded message from our President Cyril Ramaphosa. I guess he would have tried to be with us today, but he does have a Commission of Inquiry into State Capture coming out in the afternoon and generally quite a busy agenda at the moment. So if we could please play that video from President Ramaphosa. Program Director, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, I wish to congratulate the Institute for Security Studies on the launch of this new knowledge platform on the long-term prospects for the African continent. The research, analysis and technical support provided by the ISS to strengthen governance and policy making has been invaluable over many years. I am certain that this new initiative will follow in a similar vein. While the focus of the Institute has traditionally been on peace and security issues, it has increasingly paid attention to Africa's developmental pathway. This new resource will help answer a number of pressing development questions, such as whether the growth of Africa's populations and economies will be sufficient to improve overall well-being. In his 2020 book, Africa First, Dr. Jackie Sliers writes that Africa has a bright future. If Africans get behind good governance, take responsibility for the continent's development, and seize the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. The Africa Futures website will help us to imagine and work towards that bright future. The website covers a broad range of issues that are vital to Africa's transformation. These include health, education, agriculture, technological innovation, manufacturing, trade and infrastructure. What stands out from the scenarios described on the website is the huge potential impact of the African continental free trade area on the continent's growth and development. The scenarios make the point that for many countries, agriculture has the greatest potential to ignite more rapid growth and also to alleviate poverty. At the same time, there is both a great need and plentiful opportunities for Africa to harness the power of rapidly changing technology. This will be vital as African countries make the transition to low carbon, inclusive and climate resilient economies and societies. The scenarios on this site should inform and inspire us as leaders, as business people, as academia and civil society, as we look for new ways and answers 
to understand the complexities of development on our continent. This site should assist us collectively to develop more appropriate policies, build our capacity, and ultimately deliver better developmental outcomes. By aligning its work with the priority areas of Agenda 2063, the Institute for Security Studies is lending its weight to the Pan-African drive for unity, self-determination, freedom, progress, and collective prosperity. I therefore commend the Institute on the work that has gone into mapping out Africa's potential futures. I have no doubt that this venture will greatly enrich public discourse and policy making, and it will contribute to a better understanding of how Africa can harness its vast resources and its extensive energies in the course of common prosperity. I thank you. And we very much thank President Cyril Ramaphosa. Yaki, you wanted to come in there? Yes, um, Feriol, it's a, it's a great honor and a pleasure that the President has taken the time amongst a very, very busy schedule uh, to record that message and to uh, provide his weight uh, to the um, uh, initiatives that we are undertaking uh, on the long-term future of, uh, of South Africa. So really, really a great pleasure and an honor. But um, I guess... Um, I'll hand back to you with yes, regard to you. where to go next. So um, our apologies for the sound quality. We'll make sure that it is uploaded, the message of the president, and sent to you. Um, very welcome, Ms. Bekele Thomas. I was wondering if you had a response to the president's message there, specifically on the importance of the free trade area and as well as on how this knowledge platform or website um, can be used um, in your work. We're joined by very many attendees, um, and we greet everybody who has has joined us today. Thank you very much, Feriel, and uh, good morning to my fellow panelists, um, and good morning to the audience. Uh, well, you know, the president's um, message was very clear and, and really a uh, response to um, what the objective of this website is all about. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate, you know, the ISS for coming out with this website. Uh, you wonder sometimes how the world has been planning implementing programs without such information which is so vital and scattered information that doesn't really give you, um, you know, the a reality check of what is there and, you know, uh, and understand the needs of the people at all levels. And therefore, you know, I think this is a very opportune one. Uh, you know, we have to seize this opportunity because of the fact that the 10-year implementation plan of Agenda 2063 is coming to an end in uh, next year, in 2023, and we have to design a new 10-year plan. And in this design, actually, we had consultations with the EU Commission, and what we have agreed is that we need the voices of the people, because Agenda 2063 is not just you know the agenda of the elite, but it's the agenda of the Africans. And therefore we have now uh, designed a new mechanism, a new way of doing things, which is consultations with the people, asking them what they think of the last 10 years, the decade, and what are their own priorities, you know, for the coming 10, 10 years. And in this, you know, the, the website would provide, you know, information that is vital and, and would enhance our planning for the coming uh, decade. Uh, and therefore, you know, I'm really elated and very happy. The second thing is that although we talk about, you know, the various areas, the priority areas of the Agenda 2063 are very clear. I mean, they're, they're priorities, they have been priorities during the 70s when we had established the Lagos Plan of Action. They are the priorities today and they will remain priorities unless we implement them. And that's why actually the whole um, heads of governments of Africa, the 55 countries, created the African Union Development Agency so that you know we implement programs. That's excellent. And, and our uh, you know, job is the implementation 
WHO and the realization of the Agenda 2063. And we will highly depend on ISS, you know, to help us, you know, unlock so many, so much, you know, that we do not know. Because we're not just um, addressing yesterday's problems, but we are also addressing today's problems and we are addressing tomorrow's problems. You know, what are the, the, the challenges that we would face in 2063? So the forecast is very clear and very, you know, uh, important for us in addressing all this and also giving the momentum, you know, for an accelerated implementation, you know, because we cannot do business as usual. We have to really be at, at a rapid results, you know, uh, absolutely, and, and you know, uh, and and that's what we 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 are we are doing. So I know you have to you have to run off quickly, and I wanted to ask you, given that it's already ten years, could you tell us a story of of a trader or of a young person with a vision for our continent that's made you particularly? hopeful about the next decade and then indeed about the 30 years thereafter? Well, I tell you, you know, the young ones uh, with the technology and they're rewired in a different way, you know, whether we like it or not. I mean, I can see my children and my grandchildren, the way they think, the way they operate, the way they respond is completely different from the way I do things. And therefore we have faith in the youth, but the youth, unless facilitated, would not, you know, we would not harness their potential, and they would not be part of the transformation uh, process of this of this continent. So my hope is on the young generation, and and you know we are launching as uh, as Auda Nepal a one billion program in the coming months uh, together with some governments because we really need to inject these youthful energies in the public sector and this is what the website says you know because we have got this um the young ones with university degrees and they are they've become parasite rather than being a productive asset of of the transformation process okay. so we would like to turn that we want to inject them in the different countries uh and and train them of course to do that uh and therefore you know my actually my own conviction is that you know is the youth that would transform um our uh, our continent that would realize the agenda 2063 agenda 2063 is for them and we need to put them at the center of the implementation of the agenda and i'm so glad that this website you know is helping us in that direction giving us evidence-based uh, um evidence-based so so that we can have evidence-based policies and Great. programs Thank you very much. Um, Professor Jonathan um, Moyer, many congratulations for the site already coming up in, um, in the chat and we'll have some more videos on it. Tell us about how you developed it and how it can be used. There's quite a few specific questions which I'll ask you thereafter and some of the best examples in the world because I understand this is what your center does. Very welcome to you. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with the new CEO of NEPAT Auda as well. It's a great honor to have collaborated with NEPAT in the past, and we're very looking forward to um, continuing to pursue work in support of Agenda 2063. The tool is called the International Futures Model. It's a kind of model that tries to simulate development across a very broad range of issue areas that are interconnected. We all know that development happens in interconnected systems where conflict matters for how the economy works, youth matter for patterns of education and labor, um, issues of gender inclusion are essential to understand for the future of unlocking resilient capacity development. All of the human development elements interact with how governments work. Levels of corruption are important, effectiveness, government revenues, right? Thinking about how these policies then feed back and affect patterns of human development, that's essential as well. But that's not the end either. We all know that humans and societies interact within broader environments. So human development affects the environment, um, whether that's local issues like water resources and water use, whether that's environmental issues that happen in the home, 
where primarily women are affected by cook stoves that burn in ways that are not so clean, or whether that's climate change, uh, uh, a global phenomenon that's going to have very real effects on Africa, where Africa did not contribute to this significant problem. So how to balance and plan for all of these interacting dynamic effects? We argue that it's really important to use quantitative tools as one resource in the planning process. I really appreciated that Madam CEO mentioned that you know planning needs tools, planning needs resources in order for us to better shape and think about how the futures um, unfold. In. The tool is called International Futures. I'm going to put in the chat just a couple of recent publications um, that we've done with NEPAD um, as well as the website. Um, the, the tool was founded Come by on, Just one second, uh, please. please. Yaki, are you still screen sharing? We've got many calls to stop sharing, uh, to stop I, sharing the screen. I'm not uh, screen sharing in actual okay. fact at all. I'm just going to close my video and uh, turn my video off and go back. Um, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not screen sharing okay. at the moment. Um, I'll, just to say that our colleagues are aware of it and they're trying to fix it. Please, Prof, continue. Sorry to break your word there. Not a problem at all. Um, the tool is called International Futures, and it was developed originally by a professor named Barry Hughes, who I think is with us today in the chat. So, Barry, if you want to say hi, please do. Um, Barry developed this tool starting in the late 1970s. So the tool has a very long history of development within academic um, settings. I'm at an academic conference right now that's focused on using scenarios to combine human development with climate change to better inform UN-related reports. You asked me what are some applications of the work that we've done. In the chat, um, I put a couple of publications, one that we worked on with NEPAD that looks at the future persistent trends that are happening within Africa. Human development is changing dramatically. Populations are growing. Over the next 20 years, half a billion people each will be added to West and East Africa, transforming in fundamental ways how humans live in that space. Um, so thinking about the, the long-term future, thinking also about uncertainty in that future space. So in that report, we focused on the importance of governance as a leverage tool that can be used to shift policies and unlock this future potential. Another example of this is a second report I put in that link that looks at the Continental Free Trade Agreement. What are the opportunities for good governance to interact with improving trade relationships to further improve economic development, economic integration across the countries of Africa um, and the regional economic communities, and further unlock human development potentials. We work with a broad, broad range of organizations. Lately, we've done quite a lot of work with the UN, looking at the effect of COVID-19 on development patterns or the relationship between civil wars and poverty and human development. So there's a lot we could talk about, and I'm really honored to be here. And congratulations to Yaki and the ISS again for all of this outstanding work. We're very happy to be longstanding partners with you all, more than a decade at this point. Um, quite a few questions here, Prof. Um, one of the reasons social social media platforms overlook traditional websites is the ability for a user to instantly get feedback. Um, so, so. Are most users more inclined to ingest information via video compared to text? Nowadays, can this website be integrated in school education systems? Um, will it be translated? Um, should celebrities and social media influencers be involved to play a pied piper role to increase the exposure of the findings of the website? All those great questions coming from coming to us from Putela Mieni. Um, Prof, do you want to have a quick crack at that and then we'll move on to Ms. Bekele Thomas? I'm going to quickly pass that to Yaki, sure. who's the creator of the this website, which uses our model as an input. But Yaki? Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jonathan. Yes. Um, so the, the website's quite large, Ferial. There's uh, four and a half thousand charts on it. There's almost yes. a million words of text on it. Uh, and it's taken several years to develop. It's only available in English. Um, there is about 80 videos on it, and there's a report on every African country, and there is 11 scenarios for every African country, for every regional economic community, for every uh, um, 
country income group and for every region. So it's a massive amount of work and data. Um, we, uh, given that, we don't have the resources to make it available in other languages, but what we are going to be doing is to expanding the analysis uh, that includes gender, for example, the impact of gender and power and influence in Africa and Africa's role in the world. So uh, there's lots of work that still can and, and should be done. But I think that the link to the site has been posted um, already in the link uh, in the chat function. So hopefully people can uh, can access the site and have a look at it themselves. But hopefully we'll also get a little bit into the site. Yes, we, uh, we definitely will. The, the the website address is now in the chat. Ms. Bekele, Thomas, I know you have to, uh, to leave soon. So, Factfulness, the book um, by Hans Rosling, and then A Humankind by Rutger Bregman. Um, these are showing us the value of taking a long-term look at our world um, to find trends that may not be that may not immediately surface in the day-to-day -day drama of, of the pace of news. Um, do you think that's correct for our continent? And are you seeing certain trends um, that don't often make it into the narrative um, about Africa that is perhaps showing itself up um, in, the, in the website? Thank you very much. I think, you know, it's, it's very true. You know, some of the narratives that, you know, that, you know, hit the headlines are not really the the full picture of what Africa is, and and you know, and this kind of um, you know um, uh, innovative way of uh, really projecting the realities, but also the forecast, the benefits, you know, the uh, what there is for Africa in the future is very critical and very important. And I think I'll go back to the education. In the education sector, it's very important that our children understand what you know africa has to offer what the different scenarios are what the inaction means because like for example when we had the COVID, it's COVID is a result to some extent of the inaction you know of 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 uh, governments and 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 society society at large so you know it's very important that we integrate this as part and parcel of our planning at the, uh, the private sector level but also at the public sector level, but also, you know, a baseline for for the education sector, even if they have to deepen the studies, then at least the foundations are there. So it's very critical and very important. The other thing that I would like to say is that our relationship with the ISS, you know, is a long one, 10 years already, like uh, they said, and we will go with ISS as we go into the implementation of the 10 year uh, plan. Uh, and and also we would like to even expand it. For example, I would say the African free trade. Um, I've been telling my colleagues in our DANEPAD and also the commission that for African free trade uh, to be implemented, we need an impact study country by country so that governments can understand what would be the full impact of a free trade, you know, because there are countries where the revenues might decrease. They will not say it, but they will just block themselves from, from, uh, from implementing it or even signing the agreement. And therefore, you know, um, you know, country by country, we'll go deeper into analyzing the impact with ISS. Um, and, and like I said, you know, of course, the whole design of the 10-year implementation plan will be based on this forecast that we have and the different scenario that there is. It helps the government, you know, and I think, you know, um, I'm just um, thinking loud now. When we go to the July summit, we would like to go there with ISS to have a side event and to really, you know, show this to the governments and private sector and other participants that would be attending the, the, the summit. So this is an invitation to you, Dr. Sir. Sure, I'm sure. We'd we'll be pleased to do that. that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I just want to greet. I, I want to greet people who've joined us from Min Nguyen. Uh, welcome, Rolf Pretorius, uh, Martin Feinstein. Great question. I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, Christine M. Merkel saying surprised that gender is uh, was was a belated inclusion. Um, Erna Penning, welcome. 
Um, Barry Hughes, hello to everyone. What Yaki Saliers and others at ISS around the world have done is incredibly impressive. Mohammed Jaffa, welcome. Vila Suta Rinen, um, very welcome to all. And Af Hendrik Tafadzwa Chikwana, many questions here, but let's go with this one, Yaki. How can we end dictatorship in Africa for the benefit of all? And there are many questions along the same line in the chat. Um, Feriel, I'm I'm going to um, try and and uh, and share screen and yes. uh, perhaps um, uh, just uh, show something uh, on the site. Um, let me know if you can see the site. Yes, got it. Okay, excellent. I understand that there's been a um, uh, uh, few smaller technical issues, but um, so um, Ms. McKellie Thomas just uh, asked the question about. Uh, can we go for a forecast on every African country? Now, we've done that. Um, if you, This is uh, one way of looking at the website. Right. Where you can look at the future of every African country. You can look at the future of every region on the continent. Um, and you can look at the future of every regional economic community or income group. And um, hopefully a little bit later we can go into that. But we can also look at the future of Africa from a variety of thematic perspectives. And you've asked the question about, uh, so what is the future of, for example, coup d'etats and instability? Now, difficult as it is, we have tried to forecast what the impact of greater stability would be on the future of Africa. And we also look at, for example, what is the future of more better governance? Um, these things can be modeled, not perfectly, but we can look from a structural perspective at the relationship between, for example, democracy and growth. And for example, there is absolutely no doubt that the current wave of instability on the continent is driven in part by um, the impact of COVID and the economic downturn, because the economic downturn of COVID means that governments have less revenue to spend on providing services even including on security. And that means that people get unhappy. And that means that particularly in West Africa, um, eventually the military start taking things over. Um, and uh, we've seen a number of coup d'etats, but from a structural point of view, the general trend towards greater democracy, uh, towards greater inclusion, and towards better living is, uh, um, uh, is, a, is a strong structural trend. So. Perhaps, Ferial, what I'll do is I'll just show you perhaps one thing. Uh, we, we're talking a lot about um, about the future of Africa and where it comes yes. from. So maybe let me show you uh, this chart because this single chart explains a lot. It's a chart that looks at uh, gross domestic product per capita for Africa and the rest of the world. And it is from 1960 until today and with a forecast until 2043. So this is gross. To, this is on the left hand side is uh, 2017 dollars. At the bottom is time, um, and until 2021 or 2020, it's uh, data, and then it right. includes a forecast. And you can see the impact of COVID there. This is GDP per capita in the rest of the world, and this is GDP per capita on its current path of Africa. And you can immediately see the the, the problem. And that is that the gap between GDP per capita in the rest of the world and Africa is slowly but steadily increasing. Since the mid-1990s, things in Africa have improved, but slowly. And even on our current path forecast, the reality is that Africa is falling further and further behind. Um, a, another way of showing exactly the same trend is, uh, for example, to look at the contribution that Africa makes to global population. These are these bars, and right. this is for 1960 until 2040, and the contribution that Africa makes from an economic perspective. And you can see, th and this is why we built the website. The site really tries to say what needs to be done to stop that gap, to change that growing divide where things are improving in Africa, but more slowly than in the rest of the world. 
Um, so, Ms. Bekele Thomas, if I can bring you in here, in a large part of the website, um, or, or the part that I really enjoyed, modeled leapfrogging. So, the use of light manufacturing, uh, bringing down slightly the size of your informal sector, getting people into a formal sector, um, the, the, the wonders of fintech, um, the, the story of M-Pesa. Do you think such as uh, the use of renewable energy, do you think that such a leapfrogging is possible in the next decade, the next 20 years? You still on mute? Sorry. Um, I think we don't have a choice but to leapfrog. Uh, and it is possible. And Africa has shown that it's possible in the way it has managed the COVID-19, you know. And, and I think, you know, whenever there is a need for us to get together and to act, you know, with determination, we will do it because the resources are at our reach. And I think with the technology, uh, with the demographic dividends that we have, Africa will be able to lift frog. And, and, you know, I have 100% confidence. And, and, you know, I think, you know, that is what, you know, even from the web website, if you see the different scenario, this is what it's telling you. You know, Africa could do a meaningful thing. Yes, certainly governance is important, but we have also seen that despite, you know, if we have got a private sector that is vibrant and we have got an opulent, you know, um, uh, you know uh, middle class, then we can we can really manage to change also to reform also the governance aspect of it i think empowering citizens is very critical and very important and and this kind of you know information knowledge sharing would enable us to to really engage citizens and and make the difference that we we need you know in terms of governance so Thank yes you. i am positive i am an optimist and I think we can really defrog. Very good. Um, Prof Moya, can I take you to some of the questions here? Um, if you can, what will be the impact of climate change on the graphs for Africa versus the, wo the world? That's from Sunanda Roy. Um, the, the African continent and the, the rest would be for, for Yaki once he comes back. Could you have a crack at that one? Sure. I'm at a climate change conference now. Yes, and the, yeah, the model includes some relationships from climate change, how climate change affects agricultural systems, for example, and also how climate change can affect long-term productivity. There are, of course, very significant uncertainties associated with this kind of analysis, but the effects of climate change in Africa will be significant, but uncertainty is the primary, primary factor characterizing it. One of the frameworks that scientists use at these conferences to think about the effect of climate change is across two dimensions of challenges. One uncertainty is associated with challenges to mitigation. How effectively can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? There's a lot of uncertainty associated uh, with that. The other is challenges to adaptation. So what that means is how much will socioeconomic development allow us to adapt to a future changing climate? The climate is changing. That's un, really uncontested. Um, the question is the degree to which that change happens. That's the mitigation piece. But then like we can have a society that's much more resilient. We could have a society that has a much more inclusive set of development policies. We could have a society that has much more um, robust infrastructure, education, health, um, all of the pieces that make up human development. Or we could have one that's much more fragile. Um, where there's great inequality, where the handful of people make decisions and others are kind of left to, to, to suffer what they must in that space. Um, so that's how people think about the uncertainty associated with the future of climate change using tools like these. Um, the scenarios that Yaki and the team have built don't focus as much on the climate change uncertainty space, but it's certainly a part of the analysis and um, uh, certainly something we want to continue to improve moving forward in terms of the Certainly model. In, model. in Durban, in South Africa, Yaki, we've seen um, 
how quickly these water bombs are, are impacting. And we also have a city, Nelson Mandela Bay, named after the great man, which is about to run out of water. Yeah. So that's a crucial part um, of the website. I was interested to see um, how much the depth of information there. Can I go through some questions from Sharon van Skalkvik on leapfrogging? What, who are the leverage points to make quality internet access and affordable data available? Um, and I'll just run through a few because we're going to running up to the mark now. How relevant is small business to the prosperity of Africa? Does the the does the site model for non money factors? I guess and 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 the answer would would be yes there. And then finally from Putela. If infrastructure development was accelerated, would that contribute to closing the gap or will governance remain an Achilles heel? Um, Feriel, I'm going to try and um, and respond to those questions by um, showing you a few of the That's things that, are, that mm. are on the site. Thank you. Um, so um, let's, perhaps the, the easiest way to answer to start answering those questions is to look at what is the contribution that all of these. So remember, I started off by making the point that we model 11 different scenarios on the long term future of Africa. So um, let's look at what the uh, what the future, uh, what the impact of those uh, 11 scenarios will be on the long term future of Africa. So um, what we've done is we've um, Sorry, I'm just trying to get there for some reason. Uh, the site is not responding at the moment, which is not good. Um, I think I went out of the um, so uh, I went out of the um, out of the site. Let me just reload this um, to yeah. There's something has gone wrong now on the site. But let me what what um, so what we've done is we've. Um, looked at the impact of different scenarios on the long-term future of Africa. Um, and I'll, let me, sorry, let me just reload that. And we model what is the impact of, for example, leapfrogging on the long-term future of Africa? What is the impact of um, a demographic dividend of manufacturing, the, impl the full implementation of the um, agenda of the African continental free trade area and so on and so forth. And then we model what is the impact of each of these on, for example, uh, GDP per capita, on uh, reductions in extreme poverty, and and so on and so forth. So, um, the the intention with the site is to provide a handle for every African country, for every agency that works on Africa, to look at what is uh, what is the impact of of all of these things. Um, so. Um, very well, the, the, um, the way, for example, that we looked, one of the questions was how did we look at leapfrogging? So when we looked at leapfrogging, we looked at in particular the transition to um, uh, renewables and we looked at the impact of that. Um, and we looked um, at what is the impact of a modern technology, you mentioned FinTech, on the, on the more rapid formalization of the informal economy, which has yes. a very powerful forward because one of the, one of the reasons how Africa, one of the challenges why Africa is struggling to develop is we have a very large informal sector, which uh, contributes very little to tax. Um, it is largely, it is less productive than the formal economy. So the contributions that that gives to economic growth is, uh, is quite limited. Uh, modern technology allows the informal sector to formalize more rapidly. People contribute more to tax. That means governments have more revenue to spend on education, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. But over long-term horizons, uh, the scenario that makes the biggest contribution to the growth of Africa, out till 2033, it's uh, mostly agriculture. But beyond that, long-term, out till 2043, it is without a doubt the full implementation of the African continental free trade area. That's a very powerful message. Without Africa creating a larger integrated market where we trade with ourselves, yes. we won't go up the manufacturing ladder. We won't transform our economies. And only then oh, is Africa in a position to really start being part of the global economy. We are 3 4% of the global economy. Yet we have, you know, a, a massive population um, and a burgeoning 
uh, youth that want jobs. And eventually only the manufacturing sector has been historically the contributing factor to growth. And that's what we need to, uh, to grow in Africa. Uh, uh, we need I, to I agree with you, but it's often that. easier said than done. So overnight, the Yeovil market was burnt down, a, a wonderful hub of, of pan-African traders. Um, and that's because our country is in the midst of a massive anti-migrant wave, which could hurt um, the, the implementation of the free continental trade. It certainly by South Africa into the rest of Africa. On the site that I'm not sure that it's... I think so, hey? Yeah. <laughs> But in any case, it's now reacting I think it's again. a demand problem. It's not so bad. It's, it's okay, can we get to it? <laughs> so uh, this is, our, for example, our analysis of South Africa. It says that South Africa is one of Africa's most developed economies. We are supposed to be in a demographic dividend, but we're not getting any benefit from that. Um, and we're caught in, in a classic middle income growth trap. Um, and we are growing slower than the rest of uh, the other six African upper middle income countries. There are only seven upper middle income countries in Africa, which South Africa is one. And it's actually extraordinary that up to 50% of South Africa's population live in extreme poverty um, and that we are one of the largest um, carbon emitters in the world. So that's sort of, uh, there's a whole analysis of, of South Africa and its future on the site, what we refer to its current path. And then we do an analysis of um, what is the impact of more stability, uh, more a better demographic dividend in South Africa, mm -hmm. the provision of health and wash infrastructure, agriculture. South Africa is one of the few African countries, despite our small agricultural sector, that is food secure. And then we speak about, then we an analyze uh, the future of education. We have relatively high levels of education in South Africa, but our quality of education is poor and we are actually falling behind. And then uh, we do an, uh, a many, we um, forecast a what it what the um, a turnaround in the deindustrialization of South Africa, which is what's happening at the moment, would impact the impact of leapfrogging. Uh, we look at the impact of a free trade scenario, um, more foreign direct investment, infrastructure, better governance, and we combine all of that. Now, all of these things we can analyze. In there is on, on every African country, there is like 60 charts uh, mm -hmm. that show what is the impact of each of these scenarios um, on the future, in this case of South Africa. So let me show you the kind of analysis that we've done for every African country. Um, I'll, go, I'll go here to a chart that you also saw in the video. So this is our forecast. This is South Africa. This is uh, 2017 constant dollars. This is 2019 with a forecast of 2043. This is our forecast of Africa of South Africa's GDP per capita, the uh, uh, gross domestic yes. product per person out till 2043. It's not a very exciting forecast. It's quite flat. Four reasons that relate to our failures to implement a real turnaround in education and so on and so forth. And then these are the impact of the um, various interventions uh, that we've done. And um, there you can see the story that I've just said that over a long term horizon for South Africa, the full implementation of the African continental free trade area will give us the biggest return on our buck. And the next most powerful intervention is a is where if South Africa can turn its manufacturing industry around. And this, of course, is closely linked to the African continental free trade area as the most one of the most developed um, economies on Africa. We can our natural export destination is the rest of Africa. It's the only area where we have a competitive advantage. And it's those kind of it, it is around those visions of the future that South Africans can get together. It's because it is only if we grow the South African economy um, that we will de end our xenophobia, our uh, discrimination against foreigners, uh, the, the racism that permeates South Africa. It is economic growth. And what we do in South Africa, and fair, I'll stop on that point, yes. is we consistently talk about um, uh, uh, redistribution instead of consistently talking about growth. Because if we grow the economy, yes, then we can take the proceedings of that growth and use that to deal with our historical inequities. 
but re simply redistributing the existing shrinking cake is not taking us anywhere. Thank we you. Yeah, I was, I'm quite. I was. I was interested to see that uh, GDP numbers for the quarter came up better than expected. So did some employment numbers. So I do see green shoots, but they really are small ones. A question for you, Prof. One of the major challenges of prospective studies and future scenarios is to think about the unknown unknowns. What do you think could be the unknown key factors in Africa's future? Uh, the unknown, unknowns are always difficult because they're unknown in two ways. And so that's always a big challenge. Sometimes they're called black swans, um, wild cards. So I, let's talk about gray swans, things that we might know about, Correct. but that are very uncertain. Um, the, the big things that could affect long-term development are technological changes, right? Dramatic shifts in how artificial intelligence provides us information or manufacturing or um, transformations in energy systems. In improvements in um, energy storage would be really transformational. It's one of the technologies that's lagged behind significantly. Other big unknowns on the negative side of things are international conflict. The Russian invasion of Ukraine starts a whole new kind of way of thinking about how countries uh, are willing to fight over territory that has huge negative consequences. Um, so that those kinds of shifts in how we change our values and actions in the world or uh, environmental systems, big tipping points. These climate scenarios tend to look at smooth changes in environmental systems. Mm -hmm. But what if the um, significant amount of greenhouse gas we put in the atmosphere leads to dramatic shifts in how nature works that have cascading effects that make food production hugely uh, uncertain. That's kind of how I would think about those shifts. It's, there are so many things that represent unknown unknowns. There's a tendency sometimes to think about long-term projections as being kind of um, ostentatious in a way, yes. outlandish, like how could you say anything about the long-term future? I would encourage people to think about the long-term future in two ways. There is a lot about the world that remains continuous and is very predictable. Tomorrow you'll wake, the sun will rise. Tomorrow, South Africa will be a country. Tomorrow, so many things will be kind of persistent across time. Then there's a whole nother category of things that are changing, but where we understand how they change. Demographics. We understand how and why people have babies, how and why people migrate how and why people die. These kinds of things provide long-term patterns that are really predictable, understandable, and knowable. Then there's a whole other category, which is, let's call it unknown unknowns for now, even though that's kind of a challenging idea. Uh, and those are the things where we really need qualitative foresight. There's a whole lot of interesting work at FITS that does this kind of work and other places too. And that can help us think more creatively about opportunities and challenges, but the, it, I, 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 there's been a lot of comments in the chat that I'm really excited about, like helping policymakers think more carefully about the long-term future, understand that there are things that we know and that are kind of persistent and that should form the backbone of how we set policy strategy and then other kinds of things mm. that we have to How, how does um, this, a social media era um, or error, um, how does that work against long-term thinking? Because in South Africa, it's very hard for people to see that actually the long-term trajectory has, has been a good one. Um, there's yeah. almost um, a, a disbelief when you try and place that narrative into the public sphere. Um, I think that's a, that there, the was world, a book, yeah? there was a book written in the 1970s yeah. called Future Shock that yes. talked about what what happens in a world where there's too much information. People in the 1990s and early 2000s were like, the internet will democratize the world. Everyone will have all the information at their fingertips. We're all going to have these little magical machines that can tell us anything. Well, it turns out when that happens, we don't all sit there and digest all the information <laughs> and make kind of thoughtful decisions about that. It turns out that what happens is companies are created that incentivize like emotional reactions to particular pieces of information. And then we all revert back to these tribes 
we become more tribal in a, yeah. in a way. We become more like narrowly understanding the world because we have too much information. Too much information can be debilitating. What to do about that? No idea. If I knew the answer to yeah. that, I think, yeah. The, the world is fragmenting and that's the, the actually the challenge, both at a global and at a national and a subnational level. And our challenge, I think, is to work towards rebuilding, well, a rules-based international order, but also in the South African sense, the, the rule of law in South Africa, which in South Africa seems to be under threat because we, uh, another book that Jonathan also knows very well is a book about the signal versus the noise. There is so much noise uh, in our environment that we actually don't know what the what really is important. So what we do when we do long-term forecasting, we do structural trends. For example, the global long-term trend is towards an increase in democracy. It has been that case since the two centuries ago. So yes, the Middle East and maybe China will maybe be able to temporarily uh, hold that trend back. But is are those countries, those regions, those civilizations, because China is a civilization, is that going to buck that trend? So these long-term trends are very powerful, as Jonathan said, the continuity in them. Thank you. I just want to check if Ms. Bekele Thomas is still with us, or I think she had to run. Hello there. I think she, she's gone. I do want to whip through the questions because there's, there are many of them. Um, from Yvette Trevlin Nunn, what five positive actions can South Africa take to impactfully change the current trajectory? Um, I'll go through a few. Um, what is the foreseen long-term impact of Ukraine on the African um, growth trajectory? Perhaps you can take that, Prof. Um, how do we stop redistribution when initial distribution was skewed? I think that's apartheid. I think it's a very South African question. If, if you can just divide those um, between you, please. Jackie, I'll take the Ukraine one and you can yes. do the South Africa. Is that okay? okay? Thank you. Yes. Ukraine, three points briefly. How will the Thank Russian you. invasion affect uh, African development? The first point is um, wheat exports. There's a concern about this and wheat exports, the total effect it should be something that's felt um, and that that's going to have a negative effect. But I don't think it's going to be as catastrophic as the second effect which is fertilizer cost. The fertilizer cost issue is going to be a very significant issue because as fuel prices rise, that uh, directly affects the fertilizer cost. And that's a, a very significant issue. The third is a geopolitical point, And that is um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is going to rewire the international system. It's going to accelerate a process that's associated with the rise of China, where the world starts to look like we're moving towards probably three spheres of influence. There's a Western sphere of influence. There's this Eastern sphere of influence with Russia's invasion that's going to really cement Russia in that kind of space. Then there's this historical non-aligned movement kind of sphere of influence. Thinking about how those three separate spheres of influence interact with each other and how the Russian invasion of Ukraine will change those dynamics is something that has to be further studied. The final point on the geopolitical side of things is um, the invasion changes norms associated with how countries respond to territorial disputes. I think it would be an absolute disaster for those kinds of norms to be um, spread further in Africa, where the territorial uh, boundaries were created from a colonial process that was amazingly unjust. And so thinking about making those adjustments could be really dangerous. And I think the uh, UN ambassador from Kenya made very impressive points about this in the in the run up to Russia's invasion to Ukraine that you could look uh, on YouTube uh, and see if you were interested. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Bekele Thomas. Thank you very much. Yaki, I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, there was a, you may want to respond to the impact of, of the Ukraine war, but what the question I, that was there for you is, what's the role of small business um, in, in driving this 2063 agenda, which you say is cut up into decade implementation plans? Thank you. I think, you know, the small businesses have a major role to play and they need to grow. Um, because, you know, as more and more um, uh, young ones go into business, especially in areas which is in IT, which would accelerate, you know, the whole transformation process, um, I think it's vital and important. It's also important for the um, African free trade because, you know, we have to build the value chain 
and but you know this value chain and uh, supply chain and the forward backward linkages that we require for the African free trade to be realized need to be managed properly. We have to understand where the growth areas are and around those growth areas, we need to build these chains and we need to put the youthful energies into that. And therefore, you know, small businesses become important. Um, I remember, you know, going back, you know, um, there was uh, one of the panelists who talked about the graduation of the informal sector to formal yes. sector. Yes, through technology, we can, you know, graduate this informal sector mm -hmm. to be in the former sector, but also, you know, the young ones, when they start businesses, they don't have to be informal. You know, with technology, they go into the former yeah. sector directly and, and be, you know, the, the drivers of, of transformation. And therefore, small businesses are critical and very important. And that way, you know, they grow also, they graduate, you know, um, that's what I would say. The sectors that we are, you know, uh, right now focusing on would be uh, both on, um, you know, agriculture, but agriculture linked to manufacturing, the agribusiness. Agro yeah. yeah, yeah, is very, very important and very critical. And that is easily done. I mean, there are best practices. When I was in Benin, uh, through the Songhai program, we had put some young ones, like 150 young acting all this to, to, to Nigeria. And, and, you know, when we talk about the integration, of course, certainly the infrastructure aspect is very critical and very important. Even in the infrastructure, we need to promote the small businesses that are intermediaries towards this uh, high, you know, um, high end uh, transport systems. Um, and therefore infrastructure is critical and very important. We need to inject the young ones into that, into this, fundamental foundational sectors we need to start with those um that's what i think uh, we need to Thank do with small businesses um, yaki do you, re you remember the the two questions five positive yes. actions yeah uh, let me first make two points about Africa. Yes. Um, uh, first, um, uh, Jonathan mentioned, I thought, uh, gave a great summary of the global political changes that we're happening. From an economic perspective, the main problem that Africa faces is firstly the impact of climate change, which we've talked about. Yes. But what worries me mostly is the fact that our major you know, grow, economic growth comes from um, labor capital and technology. And what Africa has lots of is labor, but it's low skilled labor. And the rest of the world is all investing in technology, in labor reducing, labor saving. And it really worries me that our major contributor to economic growth in Africa is low skilled labor. Um, and we need to find a way of turning our human capital around. But the question was what to do in South Africa. I'll yeah, give you five, a few five points. positive actions. Huh? Yeah. I think the first point is it's not possible to redistribute our way to prosperity in South Africa. We need to grow the economy. So let me just reiterate that point and then to use those proceedings to deal with our historical inequities. But our, our current path forecast of growth in South Africa out till about 2029 is about 2.4%. That's not major. We, to get to about 3.4%, which is what we think is possible in South Africa by 2029, which is our second election cycle, yes. 2024, 2029. We need to firstly unlock our electricity constraints. That means we need a, a least cost electricity growth strategy. We're not there yet. We need to step away from um, the ideas of land reform without compensation. Um, it, it, it has a hugely negative impact upon international investment in, in South Africa. Government needs to work towards the modernization of the South African population. It needs to step away from the partnership with traditional leaders and traditional practices, modernize our traditional, uh, particularly agricultural sector. There needs to be a clear distinction in South Africa between state and party. Cadre deployment, all of these issues have caused tremendous damage in South Africa. And we'll hear more about it tonight when we get the Zondo Commission report. Yes. And we then finally, we need to adopt an inclusive approach to the South African society and economy, where we bring everybody in and we govern for all South Africans. And I wonder if any of the existing South African parties really have that vision in line. So those are, uh, apart from investor-friendly uh, uh, policies and NPA and all of that kind of stuff. That's what I would say. 
Thank you. I, I'm so interested. I'm, I'm busy going through lots of notes for my book on the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture. And I found the contributions of, of two Harvard um, professors there. And they said that South Africa is the first country they know of which has held such a transparent inquiry. Obviously, the proof yeah. of pudding is on the eating, what happens to all those recommendations which we see today. So the question here for you, Ms. Bekele Thomas from Piwe Mwabe. I'm a young person currently looking for opportunities. How do I get involved in the AFCTA? And I think that's a common question I find. How do I make this real for me? Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, that's why when I addressed first, you know, I said we are coming with the $1 billion uh, program yes. and we are really mobilizing resources. We have got a program that is very timid that is called CIFA, a small uh, you know, a skills initiative for Africa, but we need to expand it. We need to really make sure that we have innovation hubs in each and every country where, you know, uh, children, you know, or the young ones could go and, 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 and really uh, uh, valorize their, their creativity and, and innovation. So how we can Piwe get, um, get access to this one billion that's coming up? Huh? Yeah, but, you know, what we need to do is, first of all, you know, the one billion uh, program, that's just, you know, a concept right now, but certainly, you know, concepts could be realized if we have, you know, a collaborative, you know, arrangement. But some governments are, are, are very keen in having that. You know, the, the first thing that um, this uh, uh, one billion dollar program does is modernize the public sector by putting in trend young ones that are roaming around with masters, PhDs, yes. and really injecting them. You, right now, they were startups. The third one is, like I said, the innovation hubs everywhere in the country to help, you know, the incubation of ideas, you know, uh, innovative ideas, and, and make sure that there is business plan, feasibility study, and access to capital. The, and the, of course, conducive environment is critical, very important. Most of the indigenous technologies are just, you know, just house-based and they are not scaled up and we need to commercialize them. In order to commercialize them, we need to have the intellectual property right, you know, to accessible to these young ones and many other things that are supporting, you know, these young ones. And the fourth thing is really align that to the African free trade so that we know the gross sectors and we just really make sure that all these are aligned. And the last one is to make sure our education system, research institutions are again aligned to the Agenda 2063 so that research, whatever research is done, is really geared towards the transformation process. And also the learning institutions make sure that they produce all what transformation process requires. And not really, we don't need many economists, you know, for example, if there aren't engineers, doctors, and all this. So, you know, so that we have uh, the learning institutions that are really being inputs to the whole transformation Thank process. You. So this is a huge program. And I think um, with time, um, we will see it bearing some fruit. Hmm. Piwe, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, Yaki from Mpotladi, I knew Yaki wouldn't answer my question about apartheid. That's the question about um, is the focus on redistribution not understandable with our kind of history? I think you're muted. Thanks. I got so enthusiastic that I forgot about the beauty <laughs> business. I mean, South Africa cannot escape it past. Um, and no South African um, must think that it can. But um, without growth, nothing else is possible. It's a simple statement of fact. Uh, yes, how we grow and what we do, but we need to unlock our growth potential in South Africa. And I say again, and use the proceedings and how we grow to deal with our historical inequities. But if we do not find a way of, for example, changing the productive structures of our rural, uh, of traditional agriculture in the former homelands, if we don't stop deindustrializing, if we don't unlock our electricity constraints, we can kiss the future. The, we, the, there is no viable future, a long-term future 
that will grow the South African economy. And uh, so I go back to what I've, we, we, it really needs to be all hands in deck uh, to grow the South African economy. That does require a political pact at a certain point. South Africans coming together and agreeing on where we want to go and also agreeing on the redistribution that must accompany that growth. Thank you. So we're going to head towards a close in a few minutes. Prof, may I ask you to make a final uh, a f Where should, in 10 years' time, ideally, how should, how should the, um, the website be looking? How should those futures be looking? And if you could just speak about China in Africa um, as, as a key concern from quite a few commentators I've just scanned through. Yeah, thank you. Um... I'll talk to, I'll do the China one first and then go to the Thank kind you. of the future vision. If you can quite we, fast, we headed to close. I'll be super quick. Thank you. China's influence in Africa has grown dramatically. If you look at the first report I shared, this great transformations, we have data that we've measured that looks at how Chinese Afri influence in Africa has shifted across time. China is the most influential country across the continent from the outside perspective. And um, it's something important to consider. And has broad implications for democracy and rights and lots of other kinds of questions. It also lots of opportunities too. Um, in terms of where should the website be? I think you've heard all these kinds of questions of like, should it be focused on youth, small yes. business, climate, the corruption, all these issues. The All leaders and decision makers are faced with a myriad of trade-offs and complicated decisions. Tools like these can help us make better choices by objectively and transparently framing the different options we have and exploring the implications. So you can go from a menu of a thousand options to a menu of 10 options, and then look at your 10 options and figure out you know, which, which one you want to move forward with. So in the future, I think that these tools should be much more refined and allow people to do a better job of thinking about engaging in terms of the public, academic and government policymakers with Co these complicated decisions in the face of great uncertainty, but tools can help. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Bekele, Thomas, final thought, perhaps just one thing that you think we should focus on in that, in that menu of options in, in this new site? Yeah, I think, you know, like uh, Prof just said, uh, there are two aspects that are of critical importance. They're foundational, they're fundamental. The first one is an integrated approach to development. You know, one cannot be done, you know, there is no trade-off. We have to do everything together and we have to be strategic and we have to look at catalytic interventions. The second one is coordination and collaboration. I mean, you know, you cannot do it alone. We need, you know, countries to work together, but we need also the whole society, even in countries to work together, um, you know, and, and also the world, you know, to have a vision uh, that is um, that is really more of a collaborative approach. Um, you know, we've seen it over and over again, um, and that's why we have the SDGs. But that's not enough. That's not enough. And and you know, we have to also implement. You know, pronunciation and all these declarations or whatever. Yes, they're good. But unless you implement them and and uh, and apply them then they're of no use. So, you know, I think these are the three things that I would say. And and Thank we you. are so grateful to have this website because it shows us that we can do it, these three, you know, in, in, in a very um, uh, systematic way. Thank you very much. Thanks so and much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us um, with your, I hope your arm heals and that you have a good chagam. Um, I'm struggling with the pen. That's why you see me from <laughs> time to time, you know, managing the pen and talking. <laughs> thank you for being with thank us. You yeah, thank thanks. you. Yaki, final word to you. Let's thank the Hans Seidel Foundation, CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency and the Government of the Netherlands for supporting the webinar. And congratulations, Yaki, on a fabulous resource. I look forward to seeing it updated regularly and with even more videos. Final word to you, Yaki. Thanks very much, Feriel. And the updating of that site is a massive undertaking and sure. we're already starting, starting to work on there. I think um, there is no magic solution to either South Africa's challenges or Africa's challenges. We have to do all of these things. We have to um, better educate, invest in infrastructure, invest in health and wash infrastructure and all of those kind of things. So um, governments play a key role in that, as in South Africa, as in the rest of Africa. And what we as ordinary citizens need to do is to take ownership 
of that future. And to, to, to do all of these integrated things, there are certain ways in which uh, this kind of modeling can help. But the only thing that is sure is that our forecasts will be wrong. But they provide a, an aid to uh, a forecast to look at what is likely if we get our things wrong. Because we only model a number of positive interventions on the future of Africa. We don't do negative scenarios on, on this site. But um, to you, to Daily Maverick and others who have made this possible, and very and, and the thanks to President Ramaphosa, who was kind enough and amongst a very diffi uh, uh, difficult very busy and busy time, time uh, to take and to spend time in recording a message uh, that we showed it.